so the, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, chilly evening. Um, I guess I can start by saying that happiness is the ultimate currency. It's, it's like uh, what we like to say to feel more superior to economists. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, effort being put into making money, whether at the individual level or the, you know, a more larger community or national level. But if you ask yourself, why are we working so hard to make money? The answer after that will usually be uh, to be happy. Or why are you studying so hard? I want to study so hard so I can get a job. Who here wants to be happy? Of course, you're all going to raise your hands. Um, and, and so in that sense, it really is uh, the ultimate uh, currency. Now, just to be fair to economists, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not an economist. I just play one on television. <laughs> but <clears throat> economists would say we're trying, human beings are trying to maximize their utility. By utility, they mean more commonly welfare, which certainly happiness would easily translate into no. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the, the, um, so you, economists do want to maximize utility, uh, but still the mechanism by which they do that usually involves money or dollar signs. Absolutely. Um, and uh, what positive psychology, which is the part of psychology that focuses on how to be happier, how to live more positive lives, as opposed to clinical psychology, where you're trying to treat mental illness, um, a lot of positive psychology research is showing that uh, money uh, is one way uh, to gain some level of happiness, uh, but it surely is not a guaranteed way uh, to gain happiness. So there are many other paths, many other roads to being happy. Money is only one part of that path. Before you go on, if you make more money, Will you be happier? Maybe not as much happier as at the beginning when you made money and you didn't have anything. So is the curve go like up like this, that is more money, more happiness? Or does it kind of plateau? Surely it doesn't go backwards, does it? What do you think? What? Straight up? How many people are, let's, let's do it this way, so do it three way. Okay, so how many people think, can you follow what I'm doing here? Just a graph, right? So money on this axis, uh, happiness on this axis, so does it go, this is choice number one, going straight up, one for one, right? On to infinity. Does it go? Well, up to Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a reasonable, reasonable uh, maximum, okay. Does it go this way and at some point plateau? Or, and or, does anybody here think, that number three, that it goes up, up, plateaus, and then actually a certain point starts going down? That is, you have less happiness here than you had over here. All right, first, how many people for number one? It's going straight up. How many people for plateauing? How many people for plateauing and then going down some? Look at that. That good. wins. <laughs> that wins, um, and uh, the empirical answer that research suggests is, is number two. Um, that, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of wealth, uh, so it doesn't necessarily go down uh, with extreme levels of wealth, uh, but it definitely plateaus. So, given that it does plateau, we can ask another very interesting question is, at what point does it plateau in dollars? All right, let's get ask... Modern US dollars. All right, so how many people think, think that the curve start? Does it starts to plateau? Yeah, where, when does it start to plateau? Okay, so you got it again? So how much We're going straight up one, have... one for one, and then at some point it starts at some dollar. Well, some dollar. this way, where so this way, so now it's dollars on this axis, okay, and happiness up on this axis, okay, everybody follow? So we're going like this, and now at some point you all, almost everybody here thought that it plateaued. Some people thought yeah. it went down. Some people just thought it kind of leveled out. So now let's, so what should the uh, numbers be, the dollars? Uh, let, let's have the items. Well, I, I, I thought I'd give them a choice. Okay, oh, okay sure. Well, you, uh, all right, so uh, how many people think it's, <laughs> okay. How many, and I know a little bit so about let's, it. Let's talk about family income, family household income. Okay, and, and annual. Annual, annual family household income, and the fact is that in America, the median, that is 50% below, 50% above, right? The median family income, household income, is roughly $50,000 a year in the United States, maybe a touch more. But 
About 50,000. That's excellent. Thank you for reading. <laughs> so now, so let's start with 50,000. Mm -hmm. How many people think that at 50,000 or less, the plateauing begins? No. How many people think at 60,000 the plateauing starts? 60,000 family income. No. How many people think 75? Mm, smattering of hands, I'd say not even a dozen. How many people think 85? A few more. How many people think 100,000? Yeah, at 100,000, this would be a new haven, let's say, because obviously if you're in Manhattan, you got, or Shanghai or something, it's a whole different story. How many people think, uh, how many think people think more than 100,000? So it's about 100, anybody think, uh, let's just get, anybody think uh, it starts plateauing at 200,000? A uh, couple, all right, so, uh, yeah. we gotta, okay, please. And so the, the research suggests it's about 100,000. So you're, you're right on the mark, uh, very impressively. Um, so definitely if you're, you know, at the lower levels of income, um, you know, when, when housing is an issue and you have to worry about health care, uh, maybe you have to worry about putting bread on the table, definitely money, money is important, money matters. And it would be naive for a psychologist to come in and say, just try to be happy, money doesn't matter. That, that's all, you know, just a, a, not the right uh, a, approach. Um, but, but what's very interesting about positive psychology research is that one may think that, well, you know, with money you can buy stuff, why not more should be better? But it turns out, across a lot of different studies, that right around $100,000 in this country where basic needs are met, shelter, health care, um, and some recreational money, um, coverage for many educational expenses, uh, $100,000 seems to be the, the magic inflection point. And if you measure the happiness of people who make $100,000 a year, $500,000 a year, $1 million a year, $10 million a year, they are not 100 times more happier than someone making $100,000 a year. It, it really does seem to flatten out. This is, in, in economics, uh, this is known as diminishing marginal utility. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the how much extra you get, marginal, how much extra gratification, utility do you get for each increment of each extra dollar. And it's marginal meaning the extra, the next extra, and the diminishing meaning it's flattening out. Now, now, is this true? It would depend on where you were, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, this is all averages across the entire country of the U.S. So, oh, across yeah. the entire country, yeah, yeah. median income is fifty thousand dollars. You inflection. still get inflection point, meaning the, the point at which the curve changes its angle mm -hmm. uh, is a hundred thousand. Around hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So, what does that what does that tell us? What does it tell you? Well, it, it says that I think working towards making that level, amount of money so that basic needs are covered um, up to that level. It, I think it is working, making the sacrifices that a lot of us make, uh, you know, to work hard, um, maybe worth it. So I'm, I personally, when I talk to students, I'm not an advocate of what I call the hippie model. You know, let's throw away all um, desire for material goods uh, or for practical needs. I'm personally not an advocate of that, and I, and I don't encourage that of my students. But also, on the other side, don't get overly obsessed with making you know, $200,000 versus $150,000 versus $100,000. At some point, you got to make sure you have a life for yourself, a life for your friend, family, a life you know, with your friends. And the issue is that when you're overly focused on work, you know, to make that extra $10,000, $20,000, $30,000, then you start to sacrifice the things in life, the other non-economical things that make you happy. I, I want to ask one question. How, how many people, uh, this, you don't have to answer obviously, how many people here make $100,000 or more a year? How many families? <laughs> Virtually none, you see. I mean, you know, you're used to talking to a Yale audience, for, for example, who, where the expectation would be, mm -hmm. right, that everybody in the class is going to be in mm -hmm. a family that's making more than $100,000 within a few years of graduation, mm -hmm. yes? Oh, uh, sir, uh, uh, on average, yes. All right, so, so for this group of people, they're still, there's, there's a, re, the inflection point hasn't, in your terms, hasn't even happened yet, right? Yeah, but what I can say is that above the median, so let's say $50,000, 
The difference is really not large with those making $100,000. Um, it is starkly different for someone making less than $50,000, for a family making less than $50,000, then definitely money is a huge uh, and understandable preoccupation that diminishes uh, one's well-being. But again, beyond the median, between 50 and 100, yes, it levels off at about 100, but also it's it, it's really not a huge difference between 50,000. So, uh, so in other words, so so it's not a straight line after 50. Yeah. You mean it starts level the, 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 the leveling begins mm -hmm. at 50, it, or, or the, the the slope the slope of yeah, the curve it's changes. It's Everybody following that? Yeah. In other words, it's you know you're going up like this, and then at around 50, it starts to not be going straight up, a 45 degree angle yeah. anymore, one for one, right? And then when you get to 100, you're saying yeah. it's flattening out almost entirely. But yeah. are you saying that Bill Gates is not happier than I am? Uh, he may be happier than you. Um, <laughs> and I, here's, Bill Gates is an interesting example because I'd say a hedge fund manager, who's let's say a couple, there are a couple billionaire hedge fund managers, may not necessarily be happier than you. Mm -hmm. But I personally applaud Bill Gates as someone who might be happier because he spends all his money on charity. And that means people say, hey, you're a great guy, and that makes him feel no, good? No, because just the act of giving to others makes is one of the ways to be happy. How do you know that? Because that's what research shows. What, what, what is research? I mean, <laughs> research what? Did you ask people? Yeah, you ask people. You can ask people, and you try to, you can, I can do, you can do a survey here, I can measure how happy each of you is, and then we can measure your life habits. And if I separate you all into groups of people who give time or money to others versus those who don't, and I control for how much money you make, the people who give are report themselves as being happier than those who don't give. Is there, is there a problem with the people you're doing those studies on? Aren't they mainly, uh, I don't know, College kids in classes like yours. No, they, they, they are, but not, but not necessarily. Uh, there are college kids all over. They're college. Uh, they include all the whole uh, entire college population in America. So I think they're pretty valid. And so the more, why, why would that be? Why would it be? It's human nature. It's a, that, so, and this is what the positive psychology is showing: is that there are many other ways to be happy, uh, to increase your happiness. And one of them is giving. It, it's it's you know, you I I've read all the happiness not all I read a lot of happiness books. Um, and don't ask why. Uh, but um, the it, you'll see it in almost every happiness book that uh, giving uh, is a way to be happy. In fact, you can take a grumpy person. You know, can take a whole bunch of grumpy people, and then half of them you you force them to give. Okay, and the other half. You, do, you don't force them to give. Just to interject briefly, how do you force them to give? Uh, they're, they're, you, you ask them to um, donate their time to community service. Um, or, or you actually, there's some experiments where you bring people into a lab, so it is artificial, but you give them $10. So they're making $10 for showing up. And then you have them, uh, you force them to donate that money. But they get to choose where they donate that money. You know, kind of like the... Um, coffee shop, a Blue State Coffee, where you get to choose where to throw your tokens, which charity you want to help. So you just, you basically give them 10 bucks, and if, as opposed to someone who gets to keep their 10 bucks, the person who is forced to give back their money to a charity um, reports being happier. What, why should we believe them? <laughs> why, we sh why should we believe them? Do you have any um, independent confirmation that they're happier? Uh, there are ways to confirm whether they're happy or not. I can't think of one immediately. <laughs> well, you look, at, you look at brain scans, don't you? Uh, or, or psychology. So let's be clear, I'm not doing, this is not all my research. Oh, of course not. No. Yeah, I, I personally do brain scan research, but, uh, which I'm happy to talk about. But, um, but I'm talking about research that I read about. Uh -huh. Or research done by friends that I trust. Do, do, <laughs> do, do you, has brain scan research been done on this, on giving away? Uh, there is some uh, research being done uh, so the idea behind brain scans is that we can put you uh, in a machine like an MRI machine, which you use to um, scan for like fractures or abnormalities. It's a really magical device. Uh, those have been adapted so that we can image 
of which parts of your brain are active when you're doing different kinds of tasks. And I'm giving you this background because there is a part of your brain that becomes active when you experience uh, joy, uh, or to be more precise, when you experience reward. And, and this can be done very precisely. So like, you can be lying there, I'm scanning your brain, and I suddenly say, here's, here's 10 bucks, or here's 20 bucks, which I'll give you at the end of the experiment. That makes most people happy, and there's a circuitry that becomes active when you experience this reward. You can physically see it. You can, you can physically see the activation in the brain, yes, with, after you analyze it. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see what part of the brain is active when you experience these rewards. And, and, it, and it can happen in many different forms. If you can make people thirsty by asking them not to drink anything for six hours before they go in the brain scanner, and you can give them a drop of juice in the scanner, that will make the reward reach them happy. Um, you can show uh, people pictures of naked people. And that activates um, the area. Always? <laughs> what about people from a nudist colony? <laughs> Surely they're a you were by now. Well, if you show them a new body, I don't know. But, um, so uh, just these things that give us. And this is not happiness. This is we would call this more like reward and pleasure because it's momentary, uh, and it's it's generally sensory. Um, and, but but there is a circuitry that's active when you experience this immediate momentary pleasure. And so you can do the same kind of experiment, except you put people in the scanner and then make them donate money to charity, you know, because they can work, operate a computer while they're in the scanner using buttons, and have them donate to charity versus take money for themselves. And when you donate to someone else, the same reward circuitry becomes active. Wow. Is that the same reward circuitry that also is activated by certain uh, drugs? Absolutely. Um, and, and that's why we understand and study it so well, because uh, one of the reasons why a drug addiction is so hard uh, to um, eliminate uh, is because it, these, some of these drugs basically take over. Uh, they take over uh, this reward circuitry. Um, and, and so that's why we study it. We don't just study it to show naked people and naked people you know, in the scanner. That would not be ethical. But by understanding, they, I don't do those studies, unfortunately. Um, but basically, drug addiction hijacks uh, and makes the activity in this reward system abnormal. And, you know, in a way that it can't, it no longer responds normally to the usual pleasures in life uh, and can only be activated by these increasingly dangerous levels of drugs. And that's why they are so um, uh, uh, dangerous. Do you, uh, this is... I guess it's a, a tributary of the, of the main river of discussion here, but I can't help but ask because I have one friend of mine from high school whose daughter committed suicide. She was a crack addict. Um, she got off crack, and his explanation to me is that she could no longer, she was an anhedonic, I guess was the word, anhedonic, that is no pleasure, hedonism, pleasure, anhedonic, not getting any pleasure. And that her brain, he explained to me, or said to me, uh, could no longer generate I mean, uh, any pleasurable feelings without crack. She didn't want to be on crack and killed herself. Is that, that's a plausible story? That is, a, that is the majority explanation for why drug addiction is so tragic. It's, that's precisely the explanation. That is the current thing. That is the current understanding, is that drugs, uh, especially these you know, illicit drugs will uh, totally take over the system in a way that they no longer, individuals, even after they withdraw uh, and quit, you know, their, their drugs, they no longer can experience the same kind of pleasures that we, the brain has developed to experience. And, uh, and so, yeah, maybe these individuals will no longer be stimulated by the face of a loved one uh, or the joy of spending time with somebody. You know, the little things in life that really are the big things in life. Imagine not being able to experience pleasure from that. And there are many reasons why these systems may break down, but drug addiction is a sure way that they get broken. And they're very hard to fix. It can be fixed with long durations of uh, you know, norma normalcy, but, but it takes a long time. And you know, when you release people back out to the you know, real world, it just, it's, it's hard to endure.
It's hard. It's hard for the people. It's hard for people to, you know, last longer. Last longer. Long yeah. It's tough. It's the toughest. It's the biggest problem that faces modern society. I mean, again, if you think about it, well, if our goal in life is to be happy, and if drugs make you happy, then the logical answer is that then we should all be taking drugs and staying home all day. But that clearly is not the answer, right? Um, because, uh, and this is the punchline that I was saving for the end, but I'll just say it, say it now, is that the, the biggest, I think, revolutionary idea in happiness research is that the goal in life is not to be happy. How crazy is that? Even though I started off by saying, our, you know, we all, happiness is the ultimate currency, but a lot of people are thinking now that the goal in life is actually not to be happy. Uh, happiness is not an end state. It's not the goal. It's, a, it's, a, it's what we call a means. It's a mechanism of your brain. That's to say it very dryly. But it's, it's, it's an aspect of life that's there to motivate you to do things, to use your talents, to contribute to society, to have a productive life. It's actually a flip uh, it's actually a flip um, argument. So, in specific terms, then, I am happy if I give away money, but the point isn't to be happy, the point is to be doing something productive, but why, which is because caring, but isn't that, but I'm not sharing to make myself happy? So, so the way to think about this is, you know, it, and this is why it's so fascinating, we can bring in some evolutionary biology. So humans are complicated. So let's go down to, to the animal kingdom. Uh, you know, on this great earth, there are many animal species. And, 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 and many of us have pets, right? Many of us have pets as well. So we, we, we respect these animal species. Why are they on earth? What is the goal of an animal born into this world? Is their goal in life to be happy? Or is their goal in life, according to Darwin, according to evolution, is two things, right? The, the goal of life is, is one of the two things that animals or plants need to do, survive and reproduce, right? That, that is the ultimate currency according to the evolutionary biologist's point of view, okay? And that, that is the ultimate currency. And I'm not saying we're just, you know, little machines and robots walking on earth, I'm not trying to diminish the value of what we do. But the point is, from this perspective, these mechanisms in the brain that allow you to experience pleasure and happiness, they are there not as a goal of life, but to help motivate you to achieve those other two big goals, which is reproduction and, uh, and survival. As humans, I think a lot of researchers, and, and this includes academics, not just, not just psychologists, but a lot of researchers, is that we are here to make life and the world better. This includes the arts, okay? This is to advance, let's just reach our full potential. So, so it includes the arts, music, uh, you know, all the things that make life beautiful, and then technology, of course. Um, and even making money is a form, of, is a lifestyle, and, and that's good too. But we are here to be more productive, contributing members of society. And we are wired to experience pleasure when we make progress uh, in the things that we as individuals are good at. That is the revolutionary thinking of happiness research right now. And we're not saying don't be happy, of course, or don't strive to be happy. But don't be overly obsessed with happiness per se, because happiness may not be the goal of why we're here. The goal of being here on Earth is to contribute, uh, to make the best use of what talents we have and to contribute to society. And so when somebody, like my friend's daughter, mm -hmm. loses the ability <clears throat> to be happy, she loses the mechanism, or she lost. She lost the mechanism. She lost the mechanism by which to be, mm -hmm. to sustain yourself, That's right. to be productive. What else, what else makes people happy that then propels them towards these two larger goals? Self-fulfillment. Or, so here's the ugly word, self-actualization. I mean, how, how crazy of a word is that? All it means... Big, in the, big when I was younger, by the way. Uh, big yeah. in the 60s and 70s. So I had a friend who did self-actualization workshops. So. Yeah. But basically, just think about what you enjoy doing 
and what you're relatively good at. And pursue those things, that's what makes you happy. And when you pursue those things, that is generally what makes you happy. It's easy for me to say, of course, sitting up here in the abstract, but everyone has something that they're good at, or everyone has something that they enjoy, which is usually going to be different from what your, you know, other people around you enjoy doing or are good at. Uh, the key uh, is, uh, and this is something we talk a lot about in the college setting, is that the key uh, is not, you know, the job at Goldman Sachs. Um, the key is, or getting into the medical school every choice. The key is figuring out what you enjoy. You know, if you take five courses, you're going to like some and you're going to hate some others. Then pursue the things that you're that you enjoy and that you're good at. That comes relatively natural to you. That's that's the goal. And yes, finding that is a struggle. And and that's what we that's what I call the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness is not trying to make two hundred thousand dollars a year. The pursuit of happiness is finding the things out there in the world that clearly exist for everybody, unless you, you know you have these problems with drug addiction or mental illness. But most of us have these things that make us happy, and the goal is to find those things. You and I both know this, and uh, Marvin, among other distinctions, is the master of uh, college, one of the, the residential colleges at uh, Yale, Berkeley College. Um, we have both experienced the, the reality that Yale can graduating Yale University where they presumably could do almost anything. This, these are kids so privileged, really, by their you know, native smarts, by the way they were brought up, by whatever variety of lucky circumstances they've, they've had. They're so lucky, and yet, as opposed to following the advice you are now giving, although many of them have heard it, after all, everybody who's, who's taken your your introduction to psychology. But only 400 out of 1,500. Well, 400 each year. Well, 400 out of 1,500 is still more than 25 percent, right? They all apply for jobs at the hedge funds. No. Not all, but no. But a, a, a disproportionate number of them use that as the measure of success, at least at first in their lives. Is that not fair? I think it's a generalization of it. Yeah, I mean, certainly the econ makers. <laughs> Here we go again. Uh, well, yeah. a, a large number. Well, I think without specifically Goldman Sachs, there is no doubt. I, I didn't I say hedge yeah. funds, I, yeah. uh, consulting companies, and uh, financial institutions. There is a set of standards out there that are uh, over that are over that people over apply to themselves as a measure of success. So yes, Goldman Sachs Medical School is another classic one. Medical school is a huge one because a lot of students, they take an interest into it because their parents tell them to, because the parents think that it's a very stable job, which it is. Uh, but, you know, there are many other paths in medicine, many of which I, I hope many of you are pursuing here in this great college. Um, there are many ways to serve in medicine. It doesn't all have to involve an MD. Um, and, um, but to be obsessed with just that one route is very unhealthy especially if one is not enjoying the courses, uh, the coursework, and the kind of lifestyle that preparing for an MD entails. But now, here's, here's where our two disciplines sort of mm -hmm. meet or intersect. Yeah. The, when I talk to some of Yale kids in my classes, and I say, why are you trying, are you really motivated to work in finance? Which is, you know, a, a, a lot of arithmetic, a lot of not very fancy math, but you know, some math, mm -hmm. uh, but mainly uh, exciting. I mean, yeah. uh, high, hard charging, uh, uh, long hours, and mainly, mainly you make a lot of money. And I said, really, at 22, 23, that's what you're interested in. That's what you want to do. That's what's going to be self-actualizing. And they say. To me, these are Yale kids. They say, I'm afraid if I'm not on the ladder, I'll be passed. And I won't be able to get back on. Now, remember, this is an audience where virtually nobody is making $100,000 a year. Yeah, I say even, but I mean, you know, that was what you said was the point at which the plateau starts happening. That actually happens. That's what everybody else thinks here, too. 
what's going on? I mean, is there something, now I'm asking you to think in economic terms or macro economic terms, big economic terms, about what's happening in the world at this moment that would cause people who would have every possible option to get the kind of gratification you're talking about to take this much narrower path to something that you say might well not be that gratifying after all. Um, so, so that's a, a very, I think a lot of this is, is specific to maybe students who are taking advanced economic courses because there is a much larger majority of students in other majors like English or history um, or psychology where consulting and finance are definitely not on their radar uh -huh. and is not a burden uh, to them as a career path, as a, as a narrow career path towards which they feel they need to aspire. So, so I think that's probably, that could be a, maybe a separate conversation with a, that a focused audience uh -huh. uh, like that, and I have a lot to say to them, but, they, but I think, again, for, for a general um, audience, the main thing is, what do you enjoy doing? Like, do you like working with your hands? Then find a job where you can work with your hands. That's going to be, that's what's going to make you happiest. If you like working with people, find a job that where you work with people. And then if you find something and you're good at it, then the path, that builds on itself. And as long as the job is stable, um, which a, you know, education will help provide, then, then that's, there's a lot of ways to find happiness in that, in that route. Because you know, you'll have time with family, you'll have time um, for your hobbies. Um, and, and that's what the research is showing, is that people who have these 100,000 plus income jobs, there's a, a very strong correlation with high income and no personal time. And you read about this, right? You read about this. Um, and it'd be like MDs, you know, doctors, when I'm saying doctors, they are, they are on call, right? And, uh, and they have to sacrifice so much until they work in hospital. Some of them don't start until they're like 35, whereas most of us get to start to enjoy life and family and the good things, you know, right after school. Um, so there, there are these huge sacrifices that come with aiming for too much uh, money, and, and I think, again, it, it boils down to find what you love doing, and, uh, yeah. But, but, but I, th I think, again, this is, remember, we're at Gateway Community College, mm -hmm. and the people here from other places as well, but we're, we're not at Yale, mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I, I, I'm gonna, I'll have a show of hands, let's see if I'm just completely uh, wrong here, but how many people think, how many people are skeptical of following what they're truly interested in or good at and making a decent living. How many people are skeptical of that? That's, maybe that's, uh, how many people are not skeptical of that, think that that's absolutely true? Well, you, you win. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Two-thirds to one-third, something like that, I mean, of the people who voted. Yeah, and, and, and the re there is, you know, skepticism is healthy, um, and realistic as well. Um, certainly the world doesn't work in a way that it rewards people 100% for pursuing what they enjoy doing, and, and that's, that's what's challenging. Um, uh, but but I, I, what I would say is that that's not restricted to a certain uh, income bracket in this country. There, there are many people making over, uh, you know, making high incomes that are unhappy because they're stuck in jobs that they don't enjoy, and, and that's how we can actually loop back uh, to Mr. Solomon's point, is that there are many people in these finance jobs, age 40, they, they're burned out, they want to quit, and they do quit, and that's great, and then they go open up a bread and breakfast, and that's great too, or, uh, uh, and, and you know, come back to a more um, you know, grounded way of life, and, and they find happiness there. The, I, I wonder whether or not the happiness research has anything to say about people working, uh, people who don't go to Yale, who have go, gone back to school, in many cases here, right? How many people have gone back to school to be here at Gateway? So, all right. Uh, what characteristics, let's not just talk about happiness now, but psychology broadly, what characteristics uh, typify the people who succeed when they go back to something that they didn't just get, you know, uh, greased 
the wheels weren't greased for them mm -hmm. in terms of getting into Yale when they were 18 years old. Yeah, uh, the, again, there's a research, so success is different from happiness, we know that. Um, if you analyze, if you like survey and study the people who are successful by you know, everyday metrics such as income uh, and such, um, and happiness measures versus those who are less successful. Uh, one of the key characteristics of those who are successful are those who try to retool or, um, or to improve, which is, of course, meaning going back to school is the definition of someone who's trying to retool, improve uh, their skill set, their qualifications. That is, again, a very prominent feature of people who succeed versus people who don't succeed. And that's why you were almost applauding. That's why I, was, I, I, I actually almost uh, just automatically applauded because you've already taken a huge step uh, to, you know, towards um, you know, making things better, you know, both in terms of happiness and success. Now, suppose there are people here who have kids, clearly, or at least to the age where they would have kids or even grandkids, maybe, like myself. But, uh, what do you... How do I ask this question? What should I be doing with my grandkids? Let's put it that way. If they're 13, 11, 6, 5, 3, and a couple of 14-month-olds. Okay. Spending as much time with them as you can. I do that. <laughs> uh, but I sometimes feel what I'm trying to do is uh, shape them. Uh, uh, two things. One, stuff them with information. I don't guess that's a great idea, but and what I, I guess I just, because I'm a TV reporter and I'm always trying to, Hey, did you hear about this? Let me tell you more about that, you know, and so forth. I probably I think that's brilliant. Well, I don't know, but you guys should ask them. But but what should we be doing as parents and grandparents to nurture qualities in our kids that will help them at least get to that hundred thousand or the fifty thousand uh, or a hundred thousand where they can Self-actualize, okay? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. And the answer is, we've already discussed the answer. Uh, because um, what you can do as grandparents, as parents, and this is the number one best thing you can do uh, for those under your care, is to help them find and pursue what they're good at or what they enjoy doing. And this includes school, but within school it includes which subjects they may be interested in, in your case. You're throwing a lot of topics out there to see yeah. what they latch on to, right? But it's not just school. If they like sports, then help them find that sport and support them, drive them, right? What is a parent? I'm a parent too. What do I do all the time? My job as a parent is to drive, <laughs> right? Uh, all around. I spent the whole weekend driving. I spent the whole week at tournaments and stuff. What sport do they like? They, I, they tried it all out. Uh, my son was in the New Haven Soccer Junior Youth thing, and one day I saw him run away from the ball when it was going in his direction. Said, okay, soccer's not your thing. <laughs> Move on to next. Let's try squash. Let's try taekwondo. You know, and they just, they, what we can do to the extent our time and resources permit is to give them all opportunities we can, and we're blessed in New Haven that pretty much anything we would want our kids to be exposed to, they have opportunities here. Um, and, um, and then, but, but not to force anything on them. If they, if, it, if they don't like it, then you know, I think it's okay to pull back. If they just have a bad day, then it's okay to kind of help them learn the trait of persistence and dedication, like finish out the season or finish out the, you know, the, the, the amount you pay for, right? uh, which was the case in my kids. There was one day my son, uh, who does, he settled on martial arts, which, which um, he needs because he's small like me. Um, and um, there's one day he said, like, you know what, I'm going to quit. I'm tired, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, like, okay, that's fine. You know, as you know, just like you quit soccer <laughs> that day when you ran away from the ball. <laughs> um, you can quit Taekwondo, but you got to finish out the season, you know, because this is what you committed to. And, um, and so he said, okay, deal. Um, and, but, then I, but then he's continued on for two hours ever since that afternoon. He just had a cranky day. So, so it's both things, I think, but it's just giving them exposure to as much as you can um, and it doesn't have to require a lot of money. It does require your time and care uh, and understanding, and that's probably the best gift we can give to our kids. A, a word I was talking to a Yale, former Yale student of mine today, the same guy I was mentioned to it earlier, and he said, ask him about grit. Yeah. Grit. What is, 
But RIT is um, uh, a concept that's coming into vogue right now, and it's basically another word for resilience. Uh, it's another word for persistence. Uh, but the main, you know, the way to think about it is, you know, getting knocked down and coming back up. That, that's, that's what grit is. Um, and, and it's probably the most uh, important, one of the most important traits you can instill uh, in a person. Uh, if you want your kids or, or yourself to be happy, that's really great too. But if I had to get, have, have a choice, I think grit, resilience, uh, is equally important as happiness um, and, and such. Because uh, grit is what, you know, life is tough, right? I mean, we all have our forms of uh, challenges. And uh, I think a life that's shielded against those challenges is not a very genuine life. Um, but it's also a dangerous life, right? It's also a dangerous well, a dangerous life it's a weak sense. life. It's a it, fragile life. It's a fragile life, right? Because if you've never yeah. gotten knocked down, if you've slalomed your way through life, if you will. Or if someone, you know, put you on a pedestal and walked you around in life. Right. right. And then, then, then when you actually get knocked down a peg, you don't know how to handle it. You don't know how to handle it, right? And then you go to drugs. Well, we're back. <laughs> and then we're back to that. Back to drugs, yeah. Yeah, so, so resilience and grit are really uh, important, you know. And I think going back to school is a form of grit, it's a form of resilience. You decided, you know, that you wanted to take another, take your career uh, or your lifestyle to another a different level, and you decided that now is not sufficient and it's not easy to go back to school. That's a form of grit. And, and, and how, how is grit measured, or how do you know that grit is correlated with that is it correlates with it it goes up when success yeah. goes up well i think grit grit is and that's where the word persistence come into play we can only measure grit not by asking people how much grit do you have and is it one, one to ten that's not how you do it right and that, that's a good question you have to measure grit by behaviors are they persisting with a goal that they set as important and as meaningful and so again, going the fact that you are in school, that's a measure of grit, right? And, um, or... Your um, son, or your son now spending yeah, his two saying, hours. Yes, or going to his, you know, two hours a week to Taekwondo uh, is a form of grit. Uh, you know, not everyone enjoys medical school courses, but if they know in their minds that they want to be a doctor, uh, and not just, I'm not talking about MD, but just any kind of, all these courses you have to take to serve in medicine, um, in public health, well, some of those courses are not exciting, you know, <coughs> orgo, um, and um, organic chemistry is a very popular, uh, a very unpopular one. Um, and, but, you know, but to make small sacrifices for the larger goal, for the larger good, that's a form of grit as well. Um, so persistence, uh, you know, sticking with it, all pretty straight, yeah. But, but, but you said that this is a new... Uh, a new discovery, uh, and, and I would have thought that how many people before you heard about grit would have thought that grit was an important part or a key component in life? I, I don't know, uh, everybody's nodding basically, mm -hmm. they were raising their hand. So, this is not, this comes as no surprise, right? Right. right. Yeah, but, but the thing about grit is that grit is not happiness, right? It's clearly not happiness, and, um, and but, but it is a way to be productive members of society, and, and so that's why, and then in the end, that's kind of why it's an important feature, that's kind of why we're here. Are, are, are we, uh, as a civilization now, uh, because we're exposed to so many people trying to sell us things because they know those things will short-term make us happy, mm -hmm. or at least we think they will make mm -hmm. us happy, are we more challenged to show grit and to be self-actualized, to actually get to a place that you think is more meaningful than, I don't know, when I was a kid 50, 60 years ago? Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it a t is it tougher to develop grit in a society where you're bombarded by people saying, buy this, buy this, this will make you happy? question, and, that, and that there, I, that's a sharp question that actually has not been well addressed uh, in research, because it's hard to compare how things are now 
versus how things were 20, 30 years ago, because there are so many things that are different. Um, I'm trying to think, there, the, the things that make people happy are pretty constant, um, and that includes uh, spending time with family and friends, that, that's always, that always ranks very highly. Um, in, in terms of what makes people happy and what, uh, and uh, to the extent that material possessions or modern technology takes you away from person to person human interaction, then it could be detracting from um, our overall happiness and, and perhaps uh, grit. But it's unclear because, and there's research is still um, controversial, and Facebook is a good example. I mean, a lot of you, I'm sure, are on Facebook. Because on the one hand, uh, you know, cer certainly in the students that I see, you have this crazy phenomenon where one person's in this room and the other per their friend is in the next room and they're texting each other as opposed to just going over and talking with each other, right? Uh, so that's not a good thing. But on the other hand, now you have a person in this room and their friend in California and they're talking with each other and sharing pictures. Like my daughter, who has close friends in California, when I drive her to school in the morning, she takes pictures of this crazy snow in March in New England. Oh my God, how awful. And her friend in California is sending pictures of her thermometer showing 75 degrees <laughs> and sunny. So that's a human interaction too, well, which is a nice one, uh, that she stays in touch with her friend in California instantaneously on the commute to school amidst the snow. So, so I think it goes both, both ways. So the jury is still out on technology. The jury is still out on the media onslaught that we are experiencing. Um, and the jury isn't out on, on sugar, though. The jury is not. The sugar's bad. Yeah, sugar's bad. But, on, but sugar's bad, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, sugar's awful. Right. Sugar's evil. White sugar's evil. Sh sugar is the new crack. <laughs> I think everybody should take that down. But, uh, and white bread is no damn good for you either, right? Yeah, it's a form of carbs. Yeah. It's, it's like, like sugar, yeah. right? Yeah. Like sugar. So sugars, so white bread's yeah, kind of eat. Yeah. yeah, but there are many other people who are more expert on this stuff. No, I know, but you're the one who's up here, and you're <laughs> you're sticking your neck out and making yeah. these statements. Sure. But, but but that's what I'm talking about, not just Facebook or technology. Sure, sure. I mean, we are bombarded by the yeah. Ebler Elf, and the maybe that dates me, but you know, uh, we're we're bombarded by this this thing, this uh, this crispy uh, garbage here. You know, except it's not. Garbage, it's, this is what you want. Pringles, uh, that's from a long time ago. Uh -huh. Potato chips, I bet you can't eat just one, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's all about you can't just eat one, you can't eat just one. Right? Well, there's certainly a ton of work showing, uh, and, and there is not much controversy, that the tremendous marketing has led to overconsumption of unhealthy foods, which has led to the obesity epidemic, of which I'm sure you're all familiar. Right, so that's, there's definitely one you know, that huge societal problem that we're facing that's a direct result of uh, exuberant marketing and, and very effective marketing. And, um, and vulnerable yeah. brains. But, but, part and, vulnerable, and our vulnerable brains, because all those foods, of course, activate the reward system. Even just looking at the chocolate and that fancy spread over there will activate your reward <laughs> uh, neurons. Um, and we should not keep the audience from the food. No, they had a great there. Somebody right there. There we go. Good man. No, no, yeah. Uh, think uh, but the um, people before did. Yeah. Uh, so, but again, we got to eat. Food is a, is a good plan in life, but that's why there's a counter movement of eating healthy, eating local, eating more vegetables, things like that. So that's all good. And that's all good. Uh, what I can say, though, about marketing uh, is that, yes, uh, some amount of money is good. But it's also it also matters on what you spend your money on, okay? So let's let's ask this question: What are the things that you can spend money on besides the basics of life uh, uh, that make you happy? Want to just trips? Good trips. Entertainment. Entertainment like what? Shows. Shows. <laughs> concerts. Shows. Concerts. Yeah. Clothes. 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 I'm sorry. I can't hear. I'm sorry. Nightlife. The nightlife. Party. Good. Yep. Good. Music. Good. Drugs. Dr not drugs. No. Okay. Unacceptable. <laughs> Projected. Wine. Good. This is actually a brilliant um, set of answers uh, because what we're not hearing um, is 
a more expensive car or a larger yacht right. um, or a larger house. We're not hearing that. We're hearing what we would categorize as experiences as opposed to material possession. Experiences are things that are consumed but that also linger in your memories. They're not something you hold or put up as a trophy or show off to other people, although trips is unique because we can take pictures and show off to people, but that's okay. Um, and what research will show is that your money is best spent. So when you do spend money, because you should, it's good for the economy. <laughs> and it's Don't point to me when I, <laughs> I am not the economy. <laughs> it's good for the economy. And, and that's good for the you know, overall well-being. And uh, you got to spend your money. When you have a choice, spend it on experiences. Everything you said here is great. If you enjoy that sip of nice wine, enjoy it. Going to a nice restaurant, do it. Good trip, uh, do it. That's what you should be spending your money on, according to research. And here's the catch. The more money you make, the more the experiences matter than the material good stuff. You know, ironically, you may think if you make a lot of money, the material stuff will have more weight. It's actually opposite. The more money you make, the more the experiences matter even more. So, so you're doing, you already got the answer on that. Most Americans, or many Americans, on a material consumption treadmill. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't last in your memory, and then it disappoints you because it isn't the item you've bought isn't as exciting as the TV ad made it out to be, mm -hmm. or you just get tired of it, or both, mm -hmm. then are we spinning our wheel? Yeah, and in fact, this is exactly, spinning your wheels is exactly one of the big reasons why money does not buy happiness. Um, because the idea is that you get tired of stuff. And, 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 and so you, you, you come back to square one. And the example I like to use is like, you know, coming out of college, let's say you want to buy a Prius uh, because it's a, you know, good for the environment, it's a cute car, and then you buy it, it's going to make you happy for a while, There's no, that's fine, and it does, but then you get tired of it, and your expectations get higher, and the deviance between your expectations and what you have start to grow, because your expectations are growing. So then you buy the next thing, which would be, let's say, a Lexus hybrid. Okay, and, and this is talking from personal experience, although I don't own any of these cars. <laughs> um, but, um, so what's the personal experience? Is that people you know? No, the cars that I wanted to buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you get your, and I, just because I'm such a good researcher, I didn't buy, spend the money on the cars, because I knew it would make me happy. You buy your Lexus, okay, it makes you happy for a year or so, and then you get tired of it, and then your expectations start to grow because the new Tesla model has come out, you know, which, which can go from zero to 60 in four seconds. Um, do a Google of Tesla insane mode, it's hilarious. The guy's holding a cell phone, and the car moves fast, so forth, the phone flies backwards. <laughs> um, so, and then, you, and then you, there's just no limit to greed for material goods because there's always something better. You buy your little sail, you buy your little fishing boat, right? And you're happy with it, and then what do you want next? You want to buy a bigger boat, and then a bigger boat, and then a bigger boat, and then you got to have a crew, and it's just, it just never ending. That's why money does not buy happiness, because number one, you get tired of things, and so you're, it's kind of like being on what we call actually a hedonic treadmill. But number two, once you buy your next thing, then your comparison group changes, and so you're always going to feel poor until you're, unless you're Bill Gates. And, and in fact, uh, there's a great story about the guy who started Microsoft with Bill Gates, Paul Allen, mm -hmm. uh, who's also one of the several richest people in the world. And the story is about a guy named Jan Wenner, who started Rolling Stone magazine and a whole bunch of other things, and is very, very rich, and has a the state-of-the-art Gulfstream jet. So this is a private jet. And I've been on one of these one time in my life as a reporter, and it, it's unbelievable. It's just an unbelievable experience. So. Jan Wenner has a Gulfstream jet, so it's as high as you can get. He has the latest model, and he's being interviewed, and he says, yeah, you know, the Gulfstream jet was just the greatest thing in the world. And then I went on Paul Allen's <laughs> customized 737. He more said, room. and now... More leg room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> more leg room. Yes, yeah, more right. there's grand. There's more like room for the grand piano. <laughs> there's, and he said, and then I really felt like 
gee, I really wish I had a 737. No end. There's, there's, there's just no end to it all at all. Now, does that mean, and a friend of mine and I have say this to each other, have for years, that happiness in life, I know happiness is a means to an end, but happiness, but I certainly rather have it than not, that happiness in life is about managing your expectations. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right? Is that a fair way to put it? Would you yeah, so, so it's managing one's expectations, and another way that's phrased in happiness research is be happy now. Be happy now, which means be happy with what you have. Uh, be happy with what you're doing. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean be complacent. Uh, that's not what it means. It just means be thankful for what you have now and what you're doing now and the people you have around you now. Because yes, it's always good to try to self-improve uh, and to try to achieve more in life, and that's that's fine. But don't pin your happiness on that. Because you're not going to be happier in general than you are now. Happiness is a means. It's a way to get you to the next point because of what you know the benefits that it brings. But it's not the goal, and uh, you're just generally not going to be happier than you are now. I don't wait. I don't. I hope that doesn't sound depressing. <laughs> but the main point is that you can be happy now. And the more time you spend, you know, closing your eyes, living in some other world whether it's the past, uh, when you were that star, you know, uh, you know, popular star athlete in high school or something, or whether you're projecting yourself in the future where you're going to be this CEO or owner of these, you know, this set of stores or companies or whatever. You can do all that, but research will show that you're, it's not gonna, you're not going to actually be happier um, in those future or past states. A classic study is, I can ask you, and we can actually test people, um, what, how happy would you feel if I passed out a bunch of lottery tickets right now, Powerball tickets, and you won you know, $100 million? How happy would you be? You have to project how happy. You're going to be ecstatic. You know, you're just going to be off the charts happy. Give me the ticket. right? But then if you actually measure people who won the Powerball lottery or other types of lotteries, because that's what happiness researchers do, we go, hunts down people who experienced happy things and see how happy they actually are. Um, lottery winners, these people that we all predict if we were one would be so happy, they're not happier. They're happy for a while, for sure, they're, all, they're on the moon, you know, just glowing for a couple of months, but then a year later, so you, you test it a year later, they're right back to where they were, where we, where we all are which is not a bad place. Most of us are generally happy. Uh, and the goal is to appreciate that and not compare oneself to some imaginary standard by which no one uh, really is there. Is it also true, I have just two quick questions then we'll go to Q&A. Mm -hmm. Is it also true that, I, as I've read, that when people become paraplegics? Mm -hmm. Same that kind of study we've done. If you suffered a horrible accident, and lost your legs, how lousy would you feel? Of course, you'd feel tremendously lousy. You can't imagine a worse thing. But then you actually, you know, study paraplegic and ask, ask how, you know, what their well-being is like. They're, they are totally high-functioning, happy people. Because they learn, they adjust, and they learn to appreciate what they have, as opposed to focusing on what they've lost. And uh, it's okay. That, and that's a form of, and that helps, you know, great. Let's have some questions from the audience. That helps you yes, please, stand up. Uh, go right, run up right to the mic here. Could you please come up to the mic? Yeah, just come up to the mic. Uh, no, no, we, we're the friendliest guys in the world, really. You don't have to feel all self-conscious. We. Is that is that working? Yeah, good. Yeah, just talk. Come right up. And you have to look that way. Yes, I know, this is all. <laughs> wow. and so you, you'll get used to it in a second. Well, Great. I don't mean to sound pathetically cliched, but I'm actually in love. Is that and I'm happy? Is that actually like me being in love? Is that making me happier? Absolutely. I, again, family, friends, and romance um, uh, is wh why it's actually why this why we have these brain systems. They are probably the most direct 
uh, and powerful ways that you can experience happy. So you are blessed, and your partner is blessed, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so the more love you can find in this world, the better. That, that's what it's all about. Excellent. You've done very well. Thank you. Uh, Arnie, please, come up here if you would, sir. And again, face that way, but we're, we're listening to you. We can actually watch you. Uh, when we started out talking about income and happiness, where in that continuum do you put comfort levels and how do you factor in uh, increment, uh, incremental increases? Uh, so what can you uh, uh, just explain a little what you mean by comfort levels? Comfort levels as far as being able to take care of the necessities mm -hmm. and when you start talking about disposable income mm -hmm. and uh, the uses for disposable income. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, so again in the United States that um, the, the biggest break of ha happens above poverty line, right? but in, in reality, it, see, that that comfort level is something er between fifty thousand and a hundred thousand dollars. Again, varying depending on where you live. Um, yeah, and lifestyle, and, and lifestyle as well. Yeah, but it, but it's you know it's averaged across a lot of different people, so it will differ for different people. Thank you. Other questions, please uh, come up, and then why don't you come up now so that you can you, you go to this one here, please. Uh, a, few, a few years ago, there was a study that came out that showed that asked people, if you made seventy thousand dollars per year, would you be happy? And eighty percent of the people said yes. Mm -hmm. The next question was, if you found out that your coworker made mm -hmm. seventy five thousand oh, dollars a year, yeah. uh, would you still be happy? And eighty percent said they would not be happy. So right. there's this notion that happiness is relative. Yep. And now you've got emerging research showing that uh, there is a positive correlation in terms of the time spent using Facebook and levels of depression. Mm -hmm. And so when you go on Facebook and you look, you know, there's people, here's my car, here's my weekend home, here's all the vacations I'm going on. Is it possible that other people's experiences are making us unhappy? That's a great uh, question, that's a great insight, uh, and it's spot on uh, to the research, and I, I think we only alluded to it in our conversation, but again, ha income is relative, and possessions are relative, so I think we talked about Possessions being relative, but of course, income is relative. So you can be happy with 70000 but if someone who's doing identical work is making seventy five, you are going to be pissed beyond, <laughs> beyond anything. Um, and, and, so that, and that's why even if you're making a million dollars at a hedge fund, if your coworker is making $1.5, uh, then you're just going to be miserable, even though like a million dollars is a lot of money. Um, Jan Winner and Paul Allen. Yeah. It's Jan Winner and Paul Allen. Yeah, so so it, it's it's it really hits it really hits uh, the nail um, on the head. And the second part of the question again, it was Facebook. Facebook, yeah. So sorry. So Facebook. Uh, that's why I was saying that the the jury is still out on Facebook because on the one hand it connects people, which is a plus. On the other hand, uh, and that's why I said the trips is an interesting one because the trips uh, will make you happy. But part of what makes you happy is also be able you can look at the pictures of it. Okay? But these pictures, if you share it with someone else, you know, uh, who's not able to make that nice trip, it's going to make them less happy. <laughs> so it's going both ways. And yes, there is research that literally came out last year showing that the more the people who use Facebook a lot are actually more depressed. But you know, that study, the jury's still out because it goes both ways. Yeah. You, you, and then you, uh, yep. uh, her, and then just end it. Thanks. Okay. So you mentioned you discussed how there is no limit. Closer to the so you discussed how there is no limit to greed and happiness and productivity is kind of the opposite of this greed. Would you definitively say that there is a ceiling effect on happiness? Um, I think the ceiling effect on happiness is a great question. And yes, I do think that the ceiling effect on happiness is where you want to be. And that means being, being happy with and grateful for what you have in the now, in the present. That is the ceiling effect. Um, and... Uh, and, and that should be that should be enough, right? And that but yeah, so that that's the goal. Does it does it work? And, and it, but it's hard to say. Okay, am I happy? Am I five or four or three? So the way is the and so the, I like to speak of it in terms of concrete terms, which is: Are you thankful? Do you feel thankful at the end of the day for what you have, for the shelter above you, for the food you had that day, for the friends uh, to which you're saying good night and family? If you're happy with that, then what else in life is there? Those are really neat. Yeah. So that's the ceiling might be up. What, uh, 
with marriage, for a corner category is you, that you mentioned that you thought you would be happy. Yes. You say uh, marriage. Marriage. So this is this is the uh, of my life. This is the thing of my life. And then after a while, like sixty percent of marriage is kind of divorce. So you thought that this was what I want in life, but once you get, get that special person, and then you find out that's not the what you want in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very deep uh, uh, and important insight. Uh, because yes, married people are happier than non-married people, um, but it is the case uh, that divorce rates are high, and uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, it, and so the the people who do divorce will tend to remarry again, and then they're happier again. <laughs> so, so I think you know the the thing but they there, divorce they redivorce at a the, higher rate. Though. They 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 do redivorce at a higher rate. Uh, it's almost like marriage addiction, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, uh, the it, that's a tricky one, you know. That that that's a tricky one, and uh, again, relationships are uh, important. Uh, it's also why friends uh, is a more reliable form of happiness. I'm not saying don't be. So the, the, I think the main answer here, and you, know, you can see me stumbling here because this is actually one of the trickier topics in happiness researchers, that you can't pin happiness on one thing. You can't pin it on your spouse. Certainly, you, you can't, that, that's actually that, that's a road to divorce if you pin all your happiness on your partner. Okay, so that, I think that's the answer I was stumbling and grappling for. Uh, but likewise, you can't pin your happiness on money. You can't pin happiness on your job. You can't pin happiness on your kids. You gotta, it, it's, a, it's a global thing. It's a holistic thing. Uh, and that's why you've got to be happy with the portfolio of your life circumstances, not just one person or one thing. Yeah. I thought you made a fascinating point uh, early on in the discussion, uh, talking about drugs and the way that they affect uh, yeah. those centers of the brain, yeah. uh, the same way that uh, things that make you happy mm -hmm. affect those centers of the brain. Mm -hmm. So what does happiness research show? You know, where is the crossover point? Where do things that which are otherwise healthy activities, like say giving to charity, where can those become kind of twisted and actually become more of an addiction loop like drugs? And how do you define the difference between a good, stable happiness ceiling and an addiction? Yeah, fortunately, um, fortunately for charities, um, uh, and fortunately for those who receive help from others, um, is that it, these activities do make a person happy, giving makes me happy and you happy, but only so much. So it just does not reach the level of pathology that drugs are capable of inflicting on these brain mechanisms. So in other words, and this is all like neurotransmitters, we're talking about chemicals in the brain, if I have to put one, if I name one, it's called dopamine. This, these everyday activities don't, set, don't, don't make a dopamine surge to the levels where it will cause these addiction problems. Um, it, it just it squirts just the right amount, and uh, and so it just keeps you going forever. For life, it's just in balance. Those systems are in balance, and so they keep you going for a lifetime. Um, and it's only these drugs um, or uh, that that seem to that chemically again will just overpower these systems. And the reason therefore and break the balance. And the reason therefore that you wouldn't want to even start ever taking it. That's why you want to start. It, you don't even want to try it because it literally can be that many of our brains are simply overmatched yeah. against the drug, yeah. the experience of the drug, no matter what we think our willpower is. You have no willpower against drugs. Sorry. <laughs> you can't beat the, that balance. I mean, you have some willpower, but it takes a tremendous amount of willpower. You cannot, it, you need help. You need professional help. Uh, to restrain to, yourself. Restrain, to either restrain yourself or to overcome uh, the impact of these drugs that may have already had some of that. And you know, I'm not naive here, right? We've all taken some form of drugs, uh, smoking, uh, either tobacco or, or, or marijuana, right? Uh, and drinking is a drug, you know, let's, let's be honest here. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not being, um, trying to be like, uh, you know, act as if I'm, on, you know, all, I love wine. <laughs> I mean, I drink wine all the time. Right? And I know it's bad for my reward circuitry, but I know it's not as bad as vodka. <laughs> right. uh, and I know what about gin? And gin is good. Gin is good. 
Um, yeah, so, so again, you know, to some extent, you know, it's just part of life and we, we should acknowledge that. It's, it's really, but it's the, it's the heroin, the cocaine, you know, the, it's those drugs that are illegal. That, you know, the government has set good guidelines on what, where that cut should be made. Uh, let's make this the last question. So you touched on finding happiness after loss of limb. Uh, many of us experience a lot of loss of uh, family members, loved ones. Um, how, what's the research say about the ways that we overcome loss and, and through grief to find happiness again? Uh, so in a way, uh, so this is a very serious question, uh, in a way, the a loss of a loved one, especially close, uh, a close loved one, uh, is not is not fixable. I mean, it just it just becomes a part of oneself um, because there's just no replacing that void, uh, especially if it's someone that's a close family member or a close friend. Um, does that mean the person is now doomed for depression? No, because again, happiness is a port, it's a portfolio, and uh, and, and the, the sense of loss hopefully will be balanced by a sense of, or can be balanced by a sense of gratitude for the family members that do, that are with us, uh, and also a sense of gratitude for the memories of one's loved one. Because the memories do not have to go away. The physical body may not be present, but the, 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 the intimate memories that one has had with a loved one form who we are, and that doesn't go away at all. And so as long as we have positive, uh, you know, healthy uh, memories of our loved ones uh, and remember the good things that we've learned from them uh, and appreciate the good times that we've had with them, then that, that fills a good a majority of the void. Um, but, you know, having someone to hug, missing that person to hug is hard. Uh, and, I, and I just think that's just, unfortunately, that's, that's part of life. So we got to, you know, hold on to as much as we can because they are, they're still in us. You know, we are products of those around us and that doesn't change. That, that's the now. Robert John, thank you very, very much. Thank you.